screen somewhere. It's good to see everyone here today. Um, the service is going to have a slightly different order today. Um, and to kick that off, we're not going to start with a song. We're going to start with the welcome and then do the song. <laughs> so, have you ever wanted to be in two places at once? Yeah, I think I'm sure we could all think of reasons. If you're a student, you're probably thinking, man, all this coursework I have to do, but I'd like to be out with my friends. Uh, as a parent, like Rochelle's looking at me like, yes, I'd like to be asleep right now. Um, <laughs> we would all like to be in two places at once at some times. When we gather together on a Sunday, there's a physical reality of what's going on here within these walls. But there's more than just this. We're kind of in two places at once because there's the heavenly reality. We're drawing around the throne of God. So the first song we're going to sing is uh, on Zion's glorious summit. And it's the inspiration for the song came from uh, Revelation chapters 4 and 5. It's only 24 verses for both chapters. So I just wanted to read through and just picture that this is actually what we're doing here today. Um, so this is the Apostle um, John. He says, after this, so this is Jesus just giving him some messages for some other uh, churches and begins his revelation. He says, after this, I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven and a voice, sorry, and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. Sorry. Um, At once I was in the spirit And there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, precious jewels. A rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones. Seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had the face of a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. And each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around and under their wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. And then I saw, in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. And then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. And he had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were, ho- they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God. From every tribe and language, people and nation, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on earth. And then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they sang. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. 
And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that's in them singing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. So when you look around you today, just have your spiritual eyes open. There's more going on than we can see within these walls or in the walls of your home if, if, if you're not with us this morning. So we're going to sing on Zion's glorious summit. On Zion's glorious summit stood a numerous host redeemed by blood. They him their king in strains diva. I heard the song and strove to join. I heard the song and strove Father in heaven, we're so privileged, we're so blessed, we're so honored to be standing in your presence right now, to be joining <coughs> who, not just each other, our dear family, our brothers and sisters in Christ in this room, but we're also joining in Christians all over the world who are worshiping today, and we're also joining Christians who've gone before <laughs> in the great heavenly place. I think of our loved ones that are no longer here with us, who we worship with this morning. 
thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for looking at us and saying, I love you so much, I'm going to do it. <laughs> I'm not going to hold your sins against you. I'm not going to remember them anymore. I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to deliver you. And I'm going to do it all. To you be all praise, all glory, all honor. Compared to you, we're nothing. But you look at us and say, you're something. Because you're made to carry my image. Thank you so much for your love. Help us to carry that love into every single day. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's, well, you can stay standing if you want. We've got another song. Um, or you can sit down. It's up to you. Um, it is God Be My Vision. So this is a modernized version of Be Thou My Vision, um, which I've been working on for years. <laughs> every single time I go to lead it, I tweak another line. Um, I wanted to talk about one word in particular. The third verse has a has a word buckler. God be my buckler and sword for the fight. Um other trans other translations that people have done online where they change that, they put um battle shield or breastplate because a buckler was a type of shield. I've left in the word buckler, it's not a word that we normally use and don't really know about. It was a medieval weapon, basically. Um, but it's a small shield that you use in hand-to-hand -hand combat, which could parry like the blows of a sword, but it was kind of useless at deflecting arrows because it was tiny. You'd have to be really exact at where you were going with it. Um, but it wasn't just used for defense. It was used as basically like a metal boxing glove as well. So it was an offensive weapon, and it would have like a big spike on it sometimes. Breastplates aren't offensive weapons and shields aren't offensive weapons, but bucklers were. And I like that idea that God is a protector, but he also fights his enemy. So it's he is our Amen. buckler. <laughs> there you go. So when you get to that word, you now know what it means if you didn't know before. <laughs> and after this, we'll have the sermon. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
Is that better? Fantastic. Apologies to those online if you're having a little bit of trouble with our sound this morning. We are a microphone down. Um, so apologies if you're not able to join the great worship that the galleries just led us through in full um, glory. But it's great to uh, sing songs of worship and it's great to um, it's great to think about what heaven is going to be like, um, like Scott shared. Um, today um, I have the uh, pleasure, the honour of spe uh, speaking to you and sharing the message. And, and today we're, we're going to have a little bit of what Scott talked about in the welcome of being in two places at once. Um, today's message is titled uh, A Spirit of Grace and Supplication. Um, but first I wanted to just give a quick introduction and a summary of last week. It's not going to be an extensive summary, but I really enjoyed last week's message when Simon came and spoke to us, uh, Simon Dinning from our Belfast church. And the three main things that, that we took from the message last week were that Zechariah 11 tells us without doubt that judgment is coming. And that's something that we just need to know. Simon really shared it incredibly. So if you, if you want to catch up on that, please go and listen to last week's message. But it's true, judgment is coming with certainty. And we need to be prepared, and we need to prepare others. Simon went on to share that there is no one like our God, which is true. There is no one like our God. Um, there is not a single person that exists or ever has existed or ever will exist that is like our God. He is he's completely unique. He, he is the, the head of everything. And we looked also that God relentlessly pursues his people. And that's true. It's such an encouraging promise that God will relentlessly pursue us. Now, that was hard to get out of Zechariah chapter 11 because the language can get a little bit heavy, but there's such encouragement there. And when I looked at the message, uh, at the scripture that I have to share this week, I felt similar. How did I get something encouraging out of this? But the truth is, is that there's tons of encouragement in it. Absolutely tons. And, and today, we're going to go on a little bit of a journey. We are going to go low. We're going to go, we're going to go pretty low. We're going we're gonna to get broken. And then we're going to see just the amazing grace of God as well. So it's, you know, it's, it's a message where we have to be in both places at once. Um, we can't experience the grace of God if we don't understand the brokenness that the cross brings us to. But we'll get into that. Um, today we're looking at Zechariah 12. Um, there's so much in it that I'm going to break it down. I'm going to ignore the first part. I'm going to skip over it. In fact, I'm going to summarize it really quickly now. Zechariah 12, verse 1 to 9. There's tons in there. There's loads more than this summary gives. Spend the time in it. But the summary of Zechariah 1 to 12 is with the same certainty that judgment is coming, that God wins. God has won the battle already. Uh, that's a certainty, as much of a certainty that God is going to bring judgment upon his people. God has already won. We only have to decide what side we're going to be on. Are we going to be an enemy of God or are we going to be his chosen people? It's not easy for his chosen people either, as we're going to find out in a minute as we dive into Zechariah 12, ch uh, chapter 12, verse 10 to 14, which we'll go to in just a second. But it's incredible to know that we can have certainty that our God has won. So no matter how bad it gets, we know that God has won. No matter how much our life is a challenge and a struggle, we can be on the side of the person that's already won, which is an incredible encouragement. Um, and that God that has won is pursuing us, as Simon told us last week. Turn with me to Zechariah 12 in chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse 10. Um, that's Zechariah 12, uh, 10 to 14, which is titled, encouragingly, mourning for the one they pierced. Scripture reads, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me as the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one who mourns for an only child, and grieve bitterly for him as one who grieves a firstborn son. On that day, the weeping in Jerusalem will be as great as the weeping of Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn each clan by itself with their wives by themselves. The clan of the house of David and their wives. The clan of the house of Nathan and their wives. The clan of the house of Levi and their wives. 
the clan of Shemai and their wives, and the rest of the clans and their wives. When I first read this, I thought, where am I going to go with this? <laughs> but it's obviously a messianic prophecy of Christ being, you know, uh, uh, crucified for the sa- the uh, as a sacrifice for our sins on the cross. I always wonder what the people hearing this at the time would have thought. They would have been perplexed. What's he talking about? Who knows? But we know now what he's talking about because we have, you know, we have the message of the cross. We have the New Testament. We have the scriptures. And we're so blessed that we do, that we can see the whole picture. Because the original hearers of this didn't. They had to go in faith. There's a, there's a mention of a place in here. The weeping will be as great as Hadad Ramon. Just for context, um, Hadad Ramon is on the plain of Megiddo. And that's where, um, that's where Megiddo sits, which is linked to Armageddon. But I'm not going to go into that just now. Um, but it's also where Josiah was slain. Uh, Josiah being one of the good kings which relates to Christ being a good king as well. Now, I, I find it hard to believe that the weeping would be as, 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 as great as that of Hadad Ramon, but they had no reference point to what Christ was going to come and do. What Christ did is just so much greater. But this scripture talks about mourning, that they should mourn for the one that they have pierced. And this is not God's enemies. He's not talking about the enemies. He's now talking about his people. His people should mourn for the one that they pierced. And it's true, we should. You know, we are responsible for sending Christ to the cross. But, you know, it's really good to meditate on who it was that we're responsible for piercing. Now, as many of you know, I'm not a poet. I'm not great with words. So I'm going to borrow from Charles Sturgeon um, to share from his sermon on this same scripture um, just who it was that we pierced. Uh, so Charles Spurgeon spoke. He is the light and the brightness of heaven, the express image of his Father's glory. Without him was not anything that was made, and by him all things consist. And yet the King of heaven lays aside his crown, strips himself of his purple, takes off his golden rings, and becomes an infant of a span long, and after a life of suffering, yields himself to a slave's death upon a wretched gibbet of a cross. My soul, dost thou thou not sorrow that so divine a person should sink so low? Excuse the old language here. I struggle with it too, but I think the words are great when we meditate on them. Um, Think of his purity and his character as a man In him was never any sin, and yet he suffers. His whole life was spent in doing good. Unselfishly he spared himself not, and now men do not spare him their worst cruelty. He gives food to the hungry, health to the sick, life to the dead. He hath not time for himself so much as to eat bread. He shuns no labor for the good of others. He seeks no ease for himself, and yet men whom he would bless, conspire to curse him. He lives a life of perfect holiness, in no way causing any to offend. His life is so is pure light of the sun of love. It hath no darkness whatever in it. His acts are a river flowing with crystal streams of loving kindness, untainted by selfishness or ambition, and yet he bleeds. Heaven's greatest jewel cast into the mire, Earth's purest gold trodden in the streets. He who is, uh, so he is, uh, who he, uh, the sun suffers an eclipse. He who is of earth's, the uh, he is he who is of earth's the brightest star is hidden behind black clouds. O thou immaculate man, shall I see thee bleed without compassion? O thou, Almighty God, I see the incarnate in the flesh. Suffering throes and pangs worthy of thy Godhead, without feeling commiseration of my soul stirred towards thee. This is sad indeed. Can you get the thought, my dear friends, that you made Christ dead? Yes, you. There is no, if there were no other man. Let us remember too, as we continue to the foot of the cross, that Jesus Christ 
doth not merely suffer for sin, but he suffers for you. I'm, I couldn't put it into those words. Um, it's a struggle to get through because of the old language, but that, that's who he pierced. That's Christ. You know, many of us know Christ. Some of us here don't yet know Christ. But that's who we sent to the cross. Someone who was perfect. Someone who was by very nature God. Someone who was above all things and through who all things were created. You know, this is a message that should make us feel bad. This is a message that should make us feel broken. This is a message that if we really are honest about it, is an offensive message. The creator of all things, God himself in human form, came to earth, suffered and died for our sins so that we may be restored to the right relationship with him. And it happened not because of communal sin, it happened because of my sin and your sin. And it happened for even the smallest of sins because nothing else could have restored us regardless of how small our transgressions might seem compared to the next person. There's no other way. Charles Spurgeon went on to say, men first look upon him who they pierced and then, but not, then, but not till then, they mourn for their sin. This is the common folly of men. They look for the effect in order to produce the cause. They forget the old proverb and put the cart before the horse. But our text in Zechariah 12 plainly indicates what is the cause and puts it first, assuring that the effect will follow. Repentance is, not a sense, is in no sense a title of faith in Christ. It is, on the other hand, a legitimate consequence of faith. Strong words and inspiring and encouraging ones. Um, of a man that lived a long time ago. Though this is not a message that's changed. You know, although, to be honest, we live in a time that doesn't like this message. We live in a time that doesn't like to be told, you're guilty. You're to blame for this. We don't like it. And we shouldn't like it. It should be offensive to us. It should, it should trouble us. We should look to this message and be broken. W there's two ways to respond to this message, and we'll look at them later on. But it should make a difference to us. It ca it's not something we can hear and just forget. If we actually listen, obviously many, many people, including myself for many years of my life, just ignored them. They didn't want to hear it. I don't want to know. Don't tell me. Don't tell me about God. But the message of the cross is an offensive message. It should break us. It should strip away everything. It should leave us so passionate about trying to do what we can to make it right that we change. We should be utterly broken. It should produce in us a spirit of supplication. Now, supplication, the dictionary definition, and there are a few of trying to go for the purest here, because many definitions just dress supplication up as a prayer, and it's not. Supplication is the action of asking or begging for something earnestly or humbly from someone of authority. So we are called to have a spirit of grace and supplication. Now, we can't have a spirit of grace. That comes from God. The grace is poured out upon us, but it has to have an effect. It's not just grace. And we'll look at that in a minute. It's not just grace. That can't do what God wants to do in our hearts. It has to produce a change in us. It has to produce a new being. It has to produce, it has to produce a new life. And then we get that through obedience and baptism um, in participating in the cross. But that supplication, we should spend the rest of our lives begging God to show us how to live a life that is not the one that we lived before. And of course, we're going to stuff up. But we should have that heart. And that's what the mourning is for. It's not just so we feel bad about ourselves. It's not just so that we wallow for the rest of our lives. 
we'll, we'll look in a little bit of what's to replace the morning. Not replace, coexist with the morning. Because we are, we need to stay, we need to stay sensitive to the message of the cross. You know, the message of the cross is an offensive message. It should, it is a message that should make us mourn. It's a message that should strip away everything. It's a message that should change us completely. My second point today is the power of the offense of the cross. Now, you don't hear that term very often, the offense of the cross. We hear the message of the cross. We hear, you know, sharing about Christ raising from the dead, salvation. We hear these things. But what does the New Testament tell us? I'm going to look at some of the things that Paul said about the offense of the cross. And Paul took it seriously. Paul took it really seriously and said some strong things about it because there's power in it. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 for our next couple of scriptures. We're going to miss it a couple of bits for pace, um, but please study it out in its entirety. Um, well let's look at what Paul spoke and what Paul preached passionately. So we're going to start in 1 Corinthians 1, 18, uh, 17 to 18. That's 1 Corinthians 1, 17 to 18. Scripture reads, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, it's not a clever message. It's not a message where we, we dress it up or we tell lies about it. Paul saw it as basic, as simple as we preach Christ crucified. And he, what does he say will happen if he doesn't do that? He says, lest the cross be emptied of its power. He says the, cross, the message of the cross, that offensive message is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it's the power of God. It is the power of God that we get broken. It's the power of God that everything is stripped away and something new can come in. It's a, it's, it's, it's a simple message. We can get tied up in wisdom, teaching, and you know we should study our Bible, we should teach, we should learn what the Bible says about our lives. But it's basic repentance and times of refreshing through participating in the cross. It is a basic message because it's for everybody. You don't have to be smart. It's for everybody. Moving on, just a, a, a couple of verses. Um, I've got my scripture reference for this wrong um, on my notes. So I'm going to ask, uh, we're just a couple of verses on in uh, in First Corinthians 1. Um, scripture reads, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. Um, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who God called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ and the power of God and the wisdom of God, and for the foolishness, foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Now, we don't understand why Christ had to come and die on the cross for us, why he came when he did and why it happened in the way it did. But God's wisdom is perfect. He knows that that's what we need, and he knows that we need an offensive message to get through to us. If it was just a nice message, I don't know if I'd be a Christian. I don't know if it would have changed me. I don't know if I'd have listened. I might have just seen it as good advice. But when I know what I'm responsible for, and know what my life brought about, it, ch it, it changes me. Moving on, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 29. Um, Brothers and sisters, Think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world, the despised things, and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. This helps me because... My logic can't get around the fact that God wants to break me first. Because God's just told me I'm, I've done this. I'm responsible for killing Jesus on the cross. It's really hard for me to get to God wants a relationship with me. But that's my logic and that's my wisdom. 
but God's different. God knows better. Um, God knows he, God knows me, and I don't like to give up me sometimes. And he knows that I needed to completely empty myself. And I need to do it every day as well. It's not just something that I did when I became a Christian. I need to take off me and put on Christ. And that's how I can have a relationship with God, not through being wise, or being noble and all these things. Although I want to try and be wise in a godly fashion. Um, you know, God, God wants that sinner who's responsible for sending his son to the cross because he can build on that. He can't build on somebody who's unwilling to accept what they've done. He just can't do it. Paul understood the cross and the offense of that message. He understood that we should mourn. He understood that it should change us. Turn with me to Galatians 5. Galatians 5. We're going to start in verse 6 to 11. Mike's going to come up and share communion afterwards. He's going to share a slightly extended version of this scripture in communion. But we're in Galatians 5, 6 to 11. Scripture reads... I'm going to pause before I do that. There's a bit of good news that I forgot to share. I'm going to do that first. We have a special person at the back of the room. We do. Joshua Bassa is back with us. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have you back, Joshua. <laughs> um, Joshua had to go back home to, to Lagos, but is now back with the church in, in, in Glasgow for just now and hopefully for longer, and we'll see how that goes. But we're in Galatians 5. Um, a, sorry, you just caught my eye there, and I just thought, I can't not share that. It's great news. <laughs> Uh, Galatians 5, uh, verse 6 to 11. Um, scripture reads, For in Christ, sorry, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor circ uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will uh, take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. I'll stop there for just now. Michael will share a little bit longer. This is a warning from Paul. Um, to the Galatians, reminding them you know, th there's, a, there's, there's, there's some historical stuff going on here. There's some influence of the teaching of Jewish tradition, some influence of the Sadducees, the Pharisees, saying that you need to do some of the Jewish laws first and then the Christian life. Um, our life is different. We don't have that same pressure. Um, we have different pressures but probably similar heart issues. Um, but here, um, Paul reminds us that the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And that is faith in the message of the cross, which produces an output. It's not by faith alone. We don't see that here. That isn't something that this scripture from Paul agrees with. It's faith, ex faith expressing itself through love. And that love is an active thing. In the great words of, um, of cheesy musicians, DC talk, um, love is a verb. It's a doing word. It draws us to do something in response to a trigger. And that trigger is the cross. That message of the cross should inspire us to do something out of love. That's the message, not just faith but faith expressing itself through love. And that's not works. We'll look at that a little bit later on. That's a response to the message that we've received. Paul goes on to say, you are running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? You know, he's saying to the Galatians here that something is distracting you from the message. How similar to our lives can that look? There's tons of stuff that distracts us from the message. We live in 
uh, we live in a world that's just full of entertainment and career opportunities and relationship opportunities and en- you know all sorts of comfort and distraction, all sorts of nasty social media and hatred that exists on there as well, but things that can consume us and distract us and disable us, paralyze us from acting. You know, here Paul is saying, who, who are you letting distract you? He's saying that there's a race, that they were running a good race. You know, are we running a good race? Am I running a good race? You know, was I running a good race and I've stopped now? You know, am I stationary for quite some time and need to get going? You know, the race is what we're called to do here by Paul. You know, that race is, uh, it's not a physical race. We don't run. But the race that we run is shown by our daily living, by action, by how we choose to live out the grace that we've received through the message of the cross. You know, that, that life that we live is a life of faith, love, and obedience. And that's pulled directly out of this scripture here. Who kept you from obeying the truth? The truth being faith expressing itself through love. That's what Paul was focusing on here. Not just faith alone, faith working through love and obeying that, producing an output. What does he say will happen if we allow that to happen in our lives? The same as the Gentiles, uh, the same as the uh, the, the, um, Galatians here. In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. So if the Galatians had allowed those Jewish teachings to come back in, what he was saying is that the offense of the cross might as well just not have happened because that's what transforms you, not these laws. And that's that's a, a strong message. There are so many religious things that we can get caught up in, so many nice things making us feel good about ourselves but are we so cut by the message that we live a life of faith expressing itself through love? Or is it just a life of faith? Is it just a life of knowledge, understanding? Is it just a life of feeling good about yourself? Or are you expressing it through love in faith of the message of the cross? That challenges me because sometimes sometimes it's just logical belief that gets me through. And that's not enough. That's dead. It's empty. It might as well have removed the offense of the cross. It challenges me to the heart. And I want to live that life every day that is faith expressing itself through love. I want to be in a church where people say, who cut in on you? I want to be in a church where people say, what's distracting you from living out your life? A discipling church. That's what I want to be part of. We need each other to do that because sometimes we're totally blind to it it's easy to think that putting a focus on expressing itself through love means works but that's not the case at all there's nothing that we can do to earn our salvation and I think that's one of the things that God understands about that offensive message of the cross that we don't necessarily understand is that if you actually understand that that's who you are away down there how could you ever think you could earn it no matter what you do it's only god but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't change our lives it's got to be a spirit of grace and supplication at the same time coexisting turn with uh, we're going to move on to second corinthians just shortly but my third point today is a spirit of grace and supplication. We see so many Christian messages out there in traditional Christianity that are just grace, 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 grace. But here we see the scripture says a spirit of grace and supplication, both at the same time coexisting together. You know, for me, um, the passage that really makes me think about being a having a spirit of supplication is Second Corinthians seven. Uh, verse eight, uh, 8 to 11, where it talks about godly sorrow. Turn with me. That's Second Corinthians 7, 8 to 11. Scripture reads, Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I, reg- though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I'm happy because you were made sorry. But because, uh, you were happy not because you were made sorry, 
but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so you were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. See what godly sorrow has produced in you, what earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point you've proved yourselves innocent in the matter. This ties directly in to that idea of being brought low to be lifted high. That idea of being broken. You know, that repent that 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 understanding of the offence of the cross isn't so that we feel bad forever, but it's so that this it's so that we become sorrowful as God intended, so that we're you know, so that we can then experience repentance. You know, that sorrow shouldn't lead to wallowing, that sorrow shouldn't feel lead to you being made inactive to not you know living the life you could live but it's to bring you to repentance but god then replaces it with something or not not replaces we need to have both things at the same time but god brings in comfort that is through us participating in the cross turn with me to corinthians 1 verse 3 to 7 um Corinth- uh, second sorry second corinthians 1 verse 3 to 7 the uh, scripture reads, um, the title of this section is Praise to the God of all comfort. Not to be confused with worldly comfort um, here. <laughs> um, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves received from God. For just as we share abundantly in Christ in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds in Christ. If we dis- if, if if we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope in you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, you also share in our comfort. God doesn't want to keep us down there. He wants to lift us up and he wants us to live a life that is meaningful, that is purposeful, that has a mission focus. He wants us to live a life that is for him because it's actually the most enjoyable life we can live anyway, the most satisfying life that we can live anyway. He wants to comfort us, not to make us comfortable, but he wants to comfort us because he knows that he's just told us what we did. He knows that we need his comfort. He knows that we need to understand that he loves us. And that's a, that's a super encouraging message. You know, we need to be broken, utterly broken, so that we can change, so that we can experience repentance. You know, that we can be filled of grace, filled with grace that brings comfort and you know, hope in God. We can't have the comfort without the understanding of the message of the cross. But being made low isn't enough to earn our salvation. It's all God. It's all God through grace. To go back to Charles Spurgeon's words to close, Charles Spurgeon said at the end of his message on the same passage, whatever you have sorrowed, sorry, whether you have sorrowed enough for sin or not, If you trust in Jesus Christ, you are not condemned. Your salvation is not procured by your tears, nor by your feelings, but by him who you have pierced. It's it's true. You know, we can't have one without the other, but us experiencing that feeling doesn't earn our salvation. It's all God. But that should inspire us all the more to live a life that is just for him. And ultimately, the best for us as well. Thank you very much for listening today. And let's take that one into the week with a spirit of grace and supplication. Amen. With the... There they are. <laughs> Looking for my wife. <laughs> Hi.
Um, sorry, Isaac, for switching off the microphone earlier. Just, just realised I cut off everyone online uh, when I did that. Um, I can't, can't sing with this, so I'm going to give it to Rochelle instead. Thank you, Chris. That was fantastic, and I'm still protesting this. And I know it will be <laughs> for the rest of the week, but I really loved the faith and love part. That oh, I think I kind of got sidetracked. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, it, again, if you want to stand, feel free. Don't touch. I, I find it easier to sing when I'm standing, but you don't have to. Um, but if you'd like to, then feel free. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love. And the Savior died, my sinful soul is counted to look on him and pardon me, to look on him and pardon me. Behold him there, the risen Lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased by his blood, my life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and my God. <laughs> my hope is found, he is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand, in Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, Scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. 
then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for i am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of christ no guilt in life no fear in death this is the power of christ in me from life's first cry to final breath jesus commands my destiny still far of hell no scheme of man could ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ i stand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ i'll stand can you hear me yeah, sorry about the microphone situation. We're just uh, passing this one around today. Right. Um, it's now my job to share communion. And I we're doing that at a slightly different time in the service. So I'll explain why. Um, what a great, great sermon. Uh, you know, yeah, I really, really enjoyed that. Really, really hit my heart. Um, and I think, l I think like Scott, I feel like I need a bit of time to process <laughs> that. Uh, you know, this, th this idea of the offense of the cross. Wow. You know, that makes you sit up and think, doesn't it? I, I, the reason is I, I was chatting with uh, Chris on the telephone last night about a number of things. And uh, we got onto the subject of uh, Chris's sermon for today. And he shared some of this stuff with me. And I thought, wow, you know, that's that's quite big. That's, that's, I've never really quite seen that that way before. And isn't it great to read the minor prophets because it just pulls out, you know, it's good to read the whole Bible because then it pulls out different things that you maybe don't think of all the time. I, and then after putting the phone down to Chris, I went off and I just thought, I'll just check my church suite and just see, see if I've got any tasks for church tomorrow. And sure enough, bang, there I am. I'm on communion. <laughs> and, uh, and that was that. So that was great. But then I thought, Chris has just shared this fantastic communion message with me. I don't really want to share a different one because that's actually a really powerful thought, this offensive message of the cross. So I'm just going to try and just wrap that up a little bit and just point it back towards the cross and then we can take the bread and the wine and actually meditate uh, on that. But this is a message, and just for those of you who've been in kids' ministry, and, you know, just a recap. Um, God's people pierced the Lamb, pierced Jesus, the Son of God. This is the perfect Jesus that suffered for you and me. Not suffered for sin, although maybe that's the case, but suffered for you. And Chris talked about how repentance is a legitimate consequence of faith as well. It's, you know, if we genuinely have faith, then we will genuinely repent when we're faced with the cross, faced with Jesus needing to die for us. And that offense really should break us. It should have power. It should have something in it that makes us change. And I think that is why God did it. Yeah? Yeah? God knew that we might need an offensive message to wake us up because it is in our nature to go and say, 
yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm better than you because I obey these rules or, you know, th these kind of things. And this is a, a message of Galatians 5, which I'll get to in a minute, as, as Chris said. Um, but if we are offended, and here's the good thing, if we're offended, we can be humbled, but yet later built up. Yeah? And don't worry if you're not too offended. If you're humbled, that's great. But if you're not humbled, then have you really grasped that message of the cross? Let's just look at again at Galatians 5. Um, I'm going to start from 11. I'm just going to read 11, in fact, on its own. Uh, it says, Now, brothers and sisters, this is the net translation, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. So the book of Galatians is written to what they call Judaizing Christians, Christians who wanted to go back to circumcision and keeping the law and ticking the boxes and saying, I'm good. And if that's the case, then there's no offense of the cross. There's no, oh, oh you know, I need, I need forgiveness. Look what I've done. I need this. This is what Paul was preaching against. And, uh, and in verse 13, he says, For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity to indulge your flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law can be summed up in a single commandment. You must love your neighbor as yourself. That whole law summed up in a single commandment. So it's not like this tick box thing. It's if we just get love your neighbor as yourself, then whichever boxes we tick, Jesus will be pleased as long as we just hold on to the cross where he died for us, where you know our sins are made up for, they're absolved. But let's just get on and love one another. But what about your offense? Are you offended that Jesus needed to be pierced for you? Or do you think, hey, I'm good. I maybe mean, don't need that mu as much as other people. No, let's be offended by that. That Jesus needed to be pierced for every one of us. Are you offended that Jesus wanted to suffer for you? you no, know, oh, you know, you shouldn't do that. You know, sometimes we just think we've got such a low opinion of ourselves that, you know, I'm not worthy, even if Jesus did suffer for me. Let's just, let's just deal with that, that he did. He did actually love you enough to suffer for you. And some of us have difficulty receiving love. It is, it's a common thing that, you know, sometimes we just have had so little love in our lives that we find it difficult to receive. But actually coming to the cross and being offended by that message is good for us. Yeah. And let's just not use our freedom to indulge the sinful nature. You know, we're not free from being offended. And if, we, if we're not free from being offended, then we can actually be free from everything else. You know, if we free ourselves from that idea of being offended, then we'll not be free from everything else. We'll have to deal with all the other challenges in our life. So that gives us a good mindset. And let's just have that spirit of supplication because grace is available from God. Yeah, I love that, that, uh, that Charles Spurgeon quote that Chris ended on there. Whether you have sorrowed enough for sin or not, if you trust in Jesus Christ, you are not condemned. But if we, haven't so if we feel like we haven't sorrowed enough, let's try and connect with that more so that we do suffer sorrow for it and that we can move on in joy and, and love and not feeling we have to tick so many boxes. Let's just uh, apply that to the times that we've perhaps messed up, told white lies, been impatient, whatever. Road rage, that's me. Because <laughs> only the Lamb is worthy, you know, and if I can just pull it back to Revelation 5 again, I love the way this service worked out. It's just great, you know, the Holy Spirit does these things sometimes, but you know, Revelation 5, 13, praise, glory, honor, and ruling power to the Lamb and the one seated on the throne. That is the one who saves us. That is just an incredible message. But that is, to some, the offense of the cross. Let's, let's be happy to be offended by it. And let's use that to move on in our lives. Let's pray as we take the bread and the wine just now. 
thank you, Lord in heaven, just for um, bringing us the message. You, you do have an amazing way of pointing us in the right direction in your life, whether you use the scriptures, whether you use people in the church, whether you use people outside the church, whether whatever it is that you use, the weather, I don't know, Lord, you, you, can, you can move our lives um, and, and you can move us to uh, feelings of, uh, of deep remorse, Lord. And, uh, you know, sometimes you do that through the cross. And I thank you that you've done that through the cross. Uh, Lord, just uh, just help us to, to process that in the right way. And I know Scott mentioned processing, and I feel like I need to process this too. Uh, I'm sure many of us are the same. Uh, just help us, Lord, to uh, just to take communion uh, just now and, and really be affected and, uh, and overjoyed by it as well. Thank you very, very much, Lord Jesus. Amen. There is a God in Gilead to make the wounded whole. Please don't be discouraged 
Absolutely. So we'll go ahead and sing this and then I'll, we'll pass it over to Bob Weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My, my treasures I lay up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land, we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their songs are sweet as praise drift back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Awesome, awesome. Uh, don't, don't turn your back on Rochelle. <laughs> just, 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 just leave it down whatever. That's the way that was. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I've got this the right way, the wrong way. Uh, as long as you guys can, oh, I can hear myself m very strongly now. Great job. I think let's just go ahead, first of all, just appreciate the sermon, the communion, and the worship. 
Well done, everyone. And I hope every one of you that are online, you've enjoyed uh, this, this, uh, this morning service. Just a final thought. I think, you know, often I listen to a message and it really goes into my heart. But then I think at least two or three people have shared, we need to process this. <laughs> I think it's necessary. But I can tell you that next week, we're looking, at second, uh, we're looking at Zechariah chapter 13, and I think Scott is preaching. And I can promise you, Zechariah 13, I've had a look at it. It's actually inspiring. The Lord is saying, like, I'm washing the sins of the land away. So that's really going to be encouraging. So we look forward to that as well. I think uh, the Lord blessed uh, uh, Scott something really to lift us all up. But in the meantime, if I can encourage every one of us, that during the week, we all have our, our mentors, discipling partners, the brothers and the sisters are uh, close to us. You know, we can really be open and honest. Let's talk about the message. Let's reflect on it and talk about it. How can I allow God's grace to really motivate me to really be the the one that who loves him and shares and his faith is motivated, not because I've got to do this or this or this, but I'm motivated by the grace of God, by his love, by his compassion. So let's make that time. I want to ask you, I think this is something I, every time I do get up, I ask the church, spend time with those who are close to you. Talk to them and lift yourselves up how can I be the best I can be for the Lord? Uh, that's exactly what the Apostle Paul did in 2 Timothy chapter 2, in uh, 6, 7, 8. He tells Timothy, reflect on what I'm saying, and the Lord will give you wisdom. So let's start to, uh, do that together. Uh, in closing, this Wednesday we will have our midweek online, and next Sunday we're, all of us are here together. Let's have a great time of fellowship now. That's it. Bye!